What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations, 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. And one of the other things I do online is I host and co-produce monthly online conversations for fathers that are co-sponsored by Dad Central, Canada's national fatherhood organization, and Dove Men Care. And I like to say, as always, you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. We all know that Dr. Vibe likes to have new friends on the Dr. Vibe show, joining the family. We have another new friend tonight, and what's even more better, I know that's not correct, uh, English, but it's more better to me, is we have a lady that's going to discuss a subject that I don't know if we've actually really delved into during my Dr. Vibe show journey, but let's get a little background. First up, Crystal Zen is an infectious disease physician currently working in New Orleans. She identifies her as Chinese American. Her parents are Chinese immigrants, but she was born and raised in Northern Virginia. Her schooling has taken her across the United States, including California, Philadelphia, New York, but she has chosen to reign, remain in New Orleans because of the vibrancy of its people and its great medical need. She's a strong advocate for social justice, as you will hear, particularly when it inter intersects with medicine. And she's gonna be joining us tonight talking about a great article and you definitely should check it out. You can go on the Dr. Vibe show and check it out. It's called Black Lives Matter. How Asian, how should Asian Americans answer the call? So welcome for the first time, but not the last time. Crystal Zen, how are you? Hi, Dr. Vibe. Good. I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and chat with you and with your audience tonight. Thank you so much for answering my email. You probably said, Wow, like who is this guy just reaching out from Toronto, another country, seeking you out and wanting you to come on something like this for the first time? Yeah. And I yeah, said, it's my first time, a little nervous. Yeah. And I told you we're going to take care of you. We got okay. your back. And uh, we're just going to have a conversation, no interview stuff, just a nice conversation. But before we get into the conversation topic, can you share? You gave a little bit about a little bit of your background in the intro, but can you share a little bit more with us about your background? Yeah, sure. Um, I was born in the US. I was born actually in Crystal City, Virginia, which is uh, why my parents decided to name me Crystal. Ah. I'm not speaking much English at that time. That was seemed like a um, perfect name for them. Um, my parents had come from China uh, when they were um, in, in their um, 20s to come for graduate studies. Uh, and so they settled in the Washington DC area in, in Northern Virginia. And that's where me and my brothers um, were raised and we went to school um, un until college. And um, growing up, I definitely was very much a part of the Asian American and the Chinese American um, community. Um, I think something common with a lot of immigrant uh, stories is that uh, you have your you have your um, you don't have your extended family with you in, in in your parents' adopted country, and so all your parents' friends end up being like your aunties and your uncles. Um, and I went to uh, Chinese school on the weekends, in addition to um, my public American school, and um, I went to Chinese summer camp. Uh, and then um, since then, I've lived in California, New York, Philadelphia. And then most recently moved to New Orleans to pursue my education and my, my training. And, and um, like you mentioned now, I'm a, I'm a doctor here in New Orleans and I, I love it a lot. What did your parents instill in you and your other siblings when you were growing up? Because it seems that education seemed to be stressed. I would say yes, definitely growing up. Um, I had the luxury that um, my parents uh, expected that I, I would spend all of my free time on school. And so I didn't have to, for example, um, in high school, I, I wasn't expected to um, help out as much with the household chores or babysit my younger siblings or get a job to help out with the household finances because my parents was expecting that every free minute I had uh, would be spent on getting my education and then, and then bettering myself because that was their sort of American dream for why they came and immigrated from, from China to the US. Uh, so definitely um, education was stressed in my, in my family. I, I will say I'm the oldest of four. Okay. Uh, so I have three younger brothers. So how's that household? <laughs> Oldest girl and every all the other siblings yeah. are boys. Was there a lot of pressure? First of all, 
oldest and only girl. Is there a little bit of a pressure on there? Yeah, exactly. Definitely. Um, especially being the first child of um, parents who had just come from another country and weren't really familiar with uh, social customs here. Uh, the pressure on me and uh, and education was definitely much higher. And so I was saying that, yes, education was very valued in our household, but it seemed like with each brother, it became less and less valued. <laughs> and um, in my, for just for example, my, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest and I be, I went into medicine. I became a doctor. My younger brother is a uh, engineer. And then my youngest brother uh, didn't go to college and he's a professional video game player. So what do you oh, know? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That, that's a diverse in siblings right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Was it your choice? And I'm saying this respectfully or your parents choice for you to get into medicine? You know, that's really interesting. So there's um, definitely a lot of Asian um, American children growing up feel pressure from their parents to go into certain professions. And um, I saw that a lot with with my friends feeling pressure to be a doctor or a lawyer or engineer. Um, actually, for me, uh, maybe it was the pressure from being um, a daughter that actually uh, was overweighing that because the, my parents sort of wanted me to um, you know, find a job that wasn't so, so long term and hard. And there's still, I literally just finished. Uh, so since I has graduated from high school, I just calculated this, uh, graduated from high school in 2006 and it's 2020. So that's 14 years. And I literally just finished my training. What? Uh, so that, that's 14 years. And literally my, my parents have not stopped saying, when are you going to have children? So they, they were not wanting me to go into medicine. <laughs> actually oh wow they didn't want you to go into medicine yeah i think you know there's um different uh cultural influences there there's one is that they want you to be successful uh professionally and educationally and the other is the family values and traditionally i would be expected to get married and have children and bear their grandchildren mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. th that was something that uh, i kind of went against there well, so going to med medical school, well, and congratulations for finally finishing. Thank you. Uh, were there any moments that you said, you know what, I can't go on? Medical school, I, I guess it's sort of like once you go down that path, you're just expecting, you just expect it to take a long time. And um, year by year, you gain a little bit more knowledge and maybe a little bit more responsibility. Um, so between in college, you're expected to learn all your basics, like your biology, your pre-medical requirements, your physics, chemistry. And then in the first two years of medical school, those are traditionally your lectures. So you, you learn about anatomy, uh, physiology, pharmacology. And then your last two years of medical school is when you're actually uh, working in the hospital, working with patients. And those are more your practical training years. And so the, the jump between the first half and the second half of medical school, that was the biggest uh, transition for me because it was just a completely different style of uh, learning and of of daily routine. Okay. So I, I would say there were some times when um, th that would be the time, you know, when I, it was the time when I first, I, I'd been academically successful, uh, you know, up through then, like high school, college, getting good grades. And then uh, suddenly it's like, wow, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to succeed in, in this environment. Right. It says in your bio that you're a social activist. Did did that become part of your journey while you were studying, or when did that become part of your your drive? Yeah, uh, that actually was before, and um, my decision to go into medicine is kind of tied into that. So when I when I was in high school, I was just focused with. Um, just whatever <laughs> high schoolers are usually obsessed with, like boys and well, getting into college. <laughs> and I didn't really think about what I was going to do with my life. And um, when I was a freshman in college, uh, I actually met some upperclassmen who really inspired me uh, to with their activism. Um, so I, I was I was paired with um, this organization called Asian American Big Sips, and um, my big sibs happened to be involved with a campaign um, uh, to to make our, our campus sweat free, which meant um, we, we wanted our university to not print and sell 
university apparel in their bookstores that were made in under inhumane conditions. Yep. And so this group of students um, had formed this, act, this uh, activism organization to negotiate with the university. And I, I was watching them progress throughout the year. Uh, and it got to the point where the civil discussions with the administration were not were not moving forward. And so they made this decision that they needed to take more drastic action. Uh, and so I, I joined them at that point because I, I, I realized that this was a group of students who actually had a, a goal that was outside of themselves, that was beyond just trying to get a good GPA. They actually cared about the world. And so we um, as an organization decided that uh, we had to take the step to um, perform civil disobedience and we organized a, a protest sit-in in the university president's office. So uh, we walked in there and asked to speak with him and we refused to leave until, until we were, would be able to speak with him. But um, what happened was we sat there all day and uh, finally the university was closing. And uh, when they closed, they called the police and arrested us all for trespassing. Whoa. So, yeah. so let me ask you a question, Crystal. Okay. What was your parents' reaction when they found out you had been arrested? Well, I did tell my mom before that because um, we had to be prepared for that possibility. We knew it was a very real possibility, and I needed to make sure, I don't know, if I needed bail money that she'd support me. So I called her, and um, her... Her response is something that I think maybe a lot of Asian um, immigrant parents might be thinking, might respond if their daughter said that to them. Um, she actually said to me, like, are you sure you want to do this? Because if you get arrested, this will go on your record and you'll be labeled forever as a troublemaker and nobody will want to hire you. And all universities will see this on, as, a, as a black pockmark on your record. Um, so that that does illustrate uh, what a lot of, I think, Asian Asians and Asian Americans uh, do think when it comes to activism. Um, and there is this general stereotype that Asian Americans don't, they're kind of quiet and they don't like to rock the boat. And um, there are, I mean, that that was the response that, that my mom gave me. On the other hand, though, to contrast with that, here were these um, upperclassmen, Asian American students, um, that I had met through the, the Big Six program. And the reason that the Asian American Student Organization was taking the lead on this issue was because um, a lot of those uh, factories where the apparel was being produced was, was in Asia. And so that was, that was the first time that I had seen Asian Americans being so vocal and active. And so there are definitely um, Asian Americans that are you know, all different opinions and, and personalities. I fell in love with act, social justice and activism when I was in college. And um, I decided to go into medicine as an extension of that because I realized that medicine was a place where I would be practicing that every day. I'd be advocating for my patients, whether that's uh, when we're, I'm talking to them uh, in front of their in front of them or if I'm advocating on a policy level. And um, the reason I chose infectious disease as well is very closely tied to my my love for advocacy because of the the marginalized patients and the the stigma that a lot of our patients receive. Wow. Well, continue on your activist run or journey. You caught my eye with the title of this: "Black Lives Matter." How should Asian Americans answer the call? What made you write this article? So after after George Floyd's death, um, like in a lot of the rest of the U.S. and around the world, uh, New Orleans had a lot of uh, protests, and uh, I had gone with one of my friends. This particular one was in Jackson Square, and it was sort of at the end of the week after a, a whole week of protests. So it was this culmination, and it was taking place in this very iconic square in the French Quarter um, of New Orleans. And it, it was a very charged, you could feel the energy there, uh, the gravitas. And what I realized, uh, I was listening to the speakers and, and I was on the same page. I agreed with what they were saying. Um, about um, structural racism and police brutality. But something that made me confused was that they were, it seemed like they were speaking directly to white people because they would say things like, 
white people, it's time to listen up. White people, uh, you need to acknowledge your privileges and acknowledge your uh, biases. And I was like, yeah, I can get on board with that, but are, are you talking to me? Because I'm not a white person. And so if I'm, what am I supposed to do if, I, if I'm not white? And uh, as I was listening to them talk, there was this one moment that it made that, that decision, that question very tangibly clear to me. Uh, someone started throw, throwing rocks at the speaker and uh, then the atmosphere became very tense and the speaker said, okay, all white allies to the front. And so all the, suddenly everyone started shifting positions and trading, trading spaces. Um, and I saw this mass movement of, of white people towards the, towards the stage. And I was like, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, do, do you want me to also be an ally here? And I thought, okay, let me look around to see what other uh, non-white people are doing. Uh, and really there were only a handful of other Asian Americans and um, we were all just, uh, fun seemed like we were all wondering the same thing. So that, that really got me thinking. Um, I went home that night and I started uh, doing some research and the first thing when I typed in um, Asian American and Black Lives Matter is I read about Totao. Uh, so Totao was one of the four uh, police officers who uh, was with, um, was there that night. And um, he was Derek um, Chauvin's partner. And um, I decided I was going to watch the video of, um, of George Floyd's death, because even though I knew that it was going to be very disturbing to me, um, I really wanted to see it for myself, like the, uh, see an Asian American's involvement in it for myself. So I did. And at first you see um, Totao sort of standing on the side, watching, watching Floyd and uh, watching uh, Derek Chauvin. Um, and then later, there are bystanders that start to intervene and um, start to well, try to intervene. And Tao literally stands in between the two parties and uses his own body to block them from uh, stepping in. And, um, you know, there's this number that is very infamous now. It's um, eight minutes and 46 seconds, the amount of time that uh, Derek Chauvin had kneeled on George Floyd's neck and what I was I was also just as upset about was that for eight minutes and 46 seconds there was Tao on the side just doing nothing watching encouraging and also actively preventing people uh, from stopping this so that that reaction was such a visceral one for me I was so ashamed and it made me think of a lot of experiences that I had growing up because, um, you know, this, this isn't just one bad apple. Uh, it, even though it was just a few minutes that Tao was doing that, actually, I realized that for decades, Asian American um, culture has been harming um, Black lives. And so I started to reflect on the ways. And um, one thing I do want to make clear before I move on, though, is that uh, I'm Speaking for myself as an individual, I, I'm not here, I don't represent the voices of all Asian Americans. And I can tell you that even though there are a lot of Asian Americans who, who agree with me, that there are definitely a lot who disagree with me. And that has been made even more clear after, after I wrote this opinion piece. Um, and also that the criticisms that I'm making, um, they're not going to apply to the same degree uh, to everyone in, in the Asian commu American community. But I'm just gonna speak from my experiences, the things that I've heard or that I've experienced uh, personally. And yeah. I, I received that and thank you so much for, uh, for sharing and watching that video. Uh, before we go on, I just wanna shout out one of the great supporters of the uh, Dr. Vibe show, Dr. Tachi, who hosts the livest live stream of uh, vid video, no, of media tech and pop culture. It's called Mediascope. It's on 5 p.m. on Wednesdays, Eastern time via IG Live, and then starts again up at six o'clock, the full conversation on LinkedIn, Periscope, 
Facebook Live, WJMS Radio. So definitely check it out. It's one of my go-tos when it comes to media. And also thanks again, Dr. Tachi, for your support. Let's just continue on just with officer, that officer. Officer Tao, what should he have done in your opinion? Wow, that is such a, a tough uh, question, especially um, in his identity. It's not just that he's an Asian American. And there, there's also the fact that he he's a police officer and that comes with a set of training and and biases instilled in you. So um, what he sh should he have done, I think, is to recognize that um, his partner, uh, a white person, was killing, causing harm on uh, a black person and abusing his power both as a police officer and as as a white person um, and to have stepped in um, and uh, intervened, pulled his partner off. And um, I, I think that's what I, I would imagine um, he is the right thing for him to do. When I see him, um, I see reflected in him other other people in, in the Asian American community. And, and also I, I see reflected in him myself. And so uh, what I mean by that is that growing up, um, I heard a lot of um, anti-Black racist things being said in by members of the Asian American community. And even though I wasn't the one saying them, uh, I never went in and, and stop them or explain to them why they're wrong or try to change their opinion. And so by doing that, I was ex ex giving my implicit approval that I agreed with that. And I also allowed that to be perpetuated. And if we think about all those the times that something like that has happened, that is how a culture gets created and passed on. And so Totao um, or you know, in the in my in my op-ed, I also mentioned um, Latasha Harlins, who who was killed by a Korean store owner, and Peter Liang, who uh, was a NYPD officer uh, who shot and kill, killed killed um, a Kai Kurli, uh, a black person. I think what ends up happening is that we, through all these micro actions and um, what we may not be perceiving as active racism, we actually are perpetuating a culture of racism and that ultimately results in, in these kinds of uh, actions. So even though, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't pull the trigger and I didn't kill a Kai Gurley or a Latasha Harlins or George Floyd, I think that I, and my personal opinion is that I think I would be, it would be, I would be hard pressed to find an Asian American that has not contributed to, to that in some way. And that, that complicity is something we need to recognize before we can, we can move forward and try to be uh, true allies with the black community. So um, it's really hard for me to say what um, Totao should have done, but it, using the metaphor then what I should have done uh, every time that I saw that is that I should have said, you know, no, um, actually that's not right. And um, I would educate the people uh, that are saying these things that I'm hearing. No, you're doing a fantastic job because okay. I know it wasn't easy for you to write. Mm -hmm. And I know it, it may be a, you're a little nervous about putting the words to what's been put on paper, but you're doing fine. Just speak from your heart and just breathe. Yeah. Take your time. You'll be fine. In in the article, you make a, a very powerful, you make many powerful statements, but this one really stuck out to me. And when you say, quote, Asian Americans have stood on the sidelines and watched as black Americans are murdered for too long. Why did you make that statement? So I think there's this big misconception among the Asian American community that um, because we're not the ones that are directly causing harm, that we don't have um, any responsibility for it. I was actually thinking about this because there, um, there's this uh, comedy special on, on Netflix by Ronnie Chiang, and he's a, a Malaysian uh, comedian. And 
the special is from a, a few years ago, and so it's difficult to um, criticize him. It's a different context, but I just want to sh uh, share one of the jokes that he makes in that in that video, which is that um, Asian people they should uh, something like. America should elect an Asian person to be president because that would solve the race war because um, Asians are neutral and we don't care. We don't have a bias towards white people or black people. Um, and I'm just thinking that's completely uh, not true. When we uh, see these things in the news, uh, when we hear about um, George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, or we, we just say, okay, that's not our fight. That's not our problem. We didn't cause the problem. So why should we uh, do anything to address it? And um, I, I think it's really, really uh, short-sighted for, for Asian Americans to, to be saying that. And so that's what I mean by we're standing on the sidelines, basically washing our hands of any guilt because because we're not the ones that are directly directly involved. But actually, we've been doing a lot of things that... that um, that harm black people. Okay, thank you. Uh, you make another great statement in this great article saying, quote, we continually raise up white supremacy because we benefit from our privileged status within its framework. Could you expand on that comment? One thing we were talking about earlier was, uh, you know, did my parents expect me to be a doctor? And um, so one example of, of of that statement is this um, concept of the model minority myth. And the model minority myth is uh, a stereotype about Asian Americans that Asians are um, high achieving, they go into these uh, professional jobs, they're all highly educated and um, they are law abiding. And also it, it, there's stereotypes about family values, uh, like, oh, we have, tight-knit family, families, and that's why we don't commit crimes. And um, ultimately, the model minority myth is, is a group of positive stereotypes about Asian Americans that are actually false and ultimately are harmful to um, all groups, in including us. Um, but we actually hide behind that and try to strengthen that because um, it raises our the status of Asian Americans within within this society. Um, you know, I have a lot of um, black classmates from, from medicine and I, I hear them talk a lot about how um, whenever they go into the room, nobody ever thinks they're the doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. th they think they're the transport or the person here to bring them their meal or custodial staff. Um, and on the other side, it's the complete opposite. I can't get people to stop thinking that I'm probably a doctor. Um, but the reason, the thing is that we hide behind that because if we can come across as uh, uh, contributing members to society, we don't we um, we don't cause trouble. Um, as a result, we don't experience the same kind of racism that that the black community does. You know, nobody looks at my face or a, or a face of an Asian male, uh, and generally doesn't think that they're going to be harmed. And it doesn't usually result in um, an Asian person being experiencing racism in the form of threat to our our safety. Mm. And 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 again, I love this term you used in the article: model minority myth. I had not heard that for a long time. Could you share with our audience what is meant by the model minority myth? Yeah. Um, so the model minority myth, uh, it's interesting as I was, as I was uh, learning about it too, um, it, Asian Americans have this kind of complex history in, in the US because um, a lot of the earlier generations of Asian immigrants were brought over as, you know, indentured um, servants working on the railroads, and they were laboring class, uh, low socioeconomic status, low education, and for decades in, in America, um, Asians were thought of as diseased. And, um, you know, I still get jokes said to me about like I must eat rats and bats and carry and and be really dirty. Um, and then you re you might recall in learning about the Chinese things like the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which were all 
coming from those racist ideas. And then um, the sort of the Asian um, views towards Asians started to change um, kind of like in the 60s where a lot of more highly edu educated people were coming, um, like my parents who were coming for, for education. And um, so this term uh, model minority myth came out, came about in the 60s to describe Asian Americans that were operating in um, certain professions that were um, achieving a certain um, economic and, and educational statuses. And um, it's the reason that I said earlier that it's harmful is because it's actually, it, it treats all of Asian Americans as one monolithic group and it erases a lot of the heterogeneity within us. And so, uh, for example, certain subgroups within, within Asians are not as, do not have the same educational and e economic uh, markers that attainment that as, uh, as other groups, um, for example, uh, Southeast Asian or, or Hmong Americans, which is actually the group that Total, the police officer, uh, is, is a part of. And so when we just treat all Asians as um, completely, uh, you know, we think of them as they're, they're doing fine. They don't, they don't, they don't experience the racism and it, they, they don't need any uh, social support. Uh, that actually ignores a lot of Asian Americans who are, or who are, are living in poverty uh, who, or who do need help uh, with uh, increasing education and attainment. Okay. So basically, you know, and I'll be transparent. I've heard that, you know, all Asians are smart and, you know, they do so well, like, especially I had the double whammy, like I was, especially in public school and plus my dad was an educator and he always compared me to Asian Americans. You've got to do as well as them. So I, I, I get, I get that. And I, but I know not every Asian American is a perfect student. So I, I do get what you're saying. You mentioned earlier on that when you were younger, you were hearing racist comments, racist stereotypes and things. Are you still hearing that even occasionally within the Asian American community? Uh, do you mean racism against Asians or against by Asian, Asians against black people? Asians against black people. Okay. Uh, of course, I'm still, I'm still hearing it. I mean, I heard it growing up. Uh, you know, things like someone might say, oh, I don't go to that part of town because there's a lot of black people there. Um, I once heard somebody, uh, someone in, in my Chinese school um, community, they, their parents said, I'm going to, um, I have an apartment to list and I'm only going to list it. I, I figured out a trick. I'm going to only list it in a Spanish newspaper, Spanish language newspaper, because that way no black people will apply. Things like that I heard so commonly growing up. And um, that's what I meant earlier when I wasn't, I growing up, I, I, I was raised, you know, in a different time and place. And I knew that that wasn't right, but I, I wasn't saying anything. Um, but it seems like actually now I'm hearing it even more because things are so charged and politicized now. And that's actually what really frustrated me and uh, motivated me to write this piece because after attending that protest, I was, a lot of my white friends were really thinking hard about their own uh, involvement, their own guilt, what they can do. Uh, you know, there's this term white guilt. And I wasn't seeing that from any of my Asian American friends. But what is still your generation, uh, many Asian Americans of your generation still thinking like that? Is it just because they're inheriting it from their parents? Don't they see what's going on around them? Don't they realize that some of their heritage involved racism? Yeah. Um, I, I'll give you a few examples of comments I saw uh, that either I saw before I wrote the article and that inspired, is part of what pushed me to write the article or that were direct comments in response to my article. Um, but I, I'm, on a, I'm a member of a lot of Facebook groups that have a lot of Asian Americans and I'll see comments like, well, why should we care about uh, black racism when Asian Americans are experiencing racism too? And that's been an even more popular 
statement ever since coronavirus because of the fact that there has been an increase in, in anti-Asian um, racism with, with the pandemic. Uh, I've seen statements like, um, for example, my, my high school, um, it, this is public information, they, they release their numbers. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a STEM high school that you have to apply to and they, they admitted 70% uh, Asian people and then the numbers of black people were TS. It's like, what's TS? TS stands for too small to report. Oh my God. So, and then, um, so a lot, of, a lot of people my age uh, that are Asian American are saying things that my parents' generation were saying things like, it's not structural racism. It's because black people uh, are not interested in their education or it's because black people just aren't as qualified uh, to get into this school. Um, so the idea that it's just our parents' generation, that's, that's a myth. There's people that are like me that grew up in the U.S. and still, you know, went to school probably um, are the same generation as as black people and still have still hold these thoughts. And as to why they do, uh, I do think that it's a lot of it is past those passed down cultural values, those those ideas we've internalized that we're Asian and we um, we work hard and we're smart. So we deserve all these high achieving, these achievements that we've gotten. And we just work harder than black people. I, I do think that it's it's passed down through the generations. And, and I agree, Crystal, with you saying it's passed down, but don't your generation even think that that may be maybe even a little bit wrong? Well, uh, like I said earlier, there are a lot of people who think it's wrong. I mean, myself okay. and um, even as I was preparing to write my article, I was wondering, should I even write this article? Because there's actually a lot already written out there by Asian American voices who are making the same um, argument as I am. Um, so it's definitely not, uh, not everybody, but there is, out, there is a significant number um, of people who have all sorts of opinions. But I think maybe one thing like to one um, silver lining, you know, I got this one response. Uh, someone emailed me and said that uh, he was so glad to read my article because he um, is Asian American and reading the article made him realize that his cultural upbringing did have a lot of um, a lot of anti-black racism impreg impregnated into it that he just let slide or made excuses for. And um, at the time he thought that that was an appropriate response, but he realized because of, because of um, my op-ed, he realized that how, um, what he thought was just passive was actively harmful and how now he's been inspired to take a more active um, stance in terms of uh, inspecting his own background and, and actively rejecting racism and also reaching out to other people in the Asian American community to talk about these issues. And um, when I received that response, I was just, I just felt like if I made at least one person think that, um, then all of, all of the criticism uh, that I've received from writing this article was worth it because at least there was one person that was open-minded enough uh, to consider it. And that person might be uh, passing that forward to other people as well. Great. Uh, just some quick comments. I'm just going to pull off here from uh, online. Uh, Dr. Tachi saying you are doing a great job. Uh, what else I'm going to pull out here? There's some other. Uh, she also says, which is correct, of course. If people pay attention, they would see that correctly. Black women are the most educated group in America and Nigerians are the most educated ethnic group in America. All right. Yes, I, I've actually heard that statistic before too. <laughs> so you meant, so was there trepidation in writing this article for you? Oh, of course. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think a lot of uh, Asian Americans are no longer friends with me. Oh my. <laughs> and, but how long did it take to write the article? Well, I've been stewing it ever since that night, ever since that protest 
And um, it's kind of like, I knew that I would get a lot of criticism for it. And so that was preventing me from working on it. But the more and more I was seeing um, these comments online, uh, the ones that I gave examples of, I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't stay silent any longer. And actually that, that was my whole point that I had been staying silent for my whole life. And so I just, I, it was time for me to, to say something. And so it, it actually took me maybe um, like two to three weeks of just going back and forth mentally. Uh, and then once I just committed to it, um, it, it took me um, maybe a few days to write and then a few more days to work on it with, with the editor at The Lens. Um, my, my editor, Tom Wright, has been really great and has been really um, generous in giving me this community uh, forum to, to express myself. What are some of the pushback you've been getting on this article? Well, uh, a lot of the things that I already mentioned um, that drove me to write the article in the first place, um, uh, one of the loudest criticisms that I've gotten is I'm quite unabashedly critical of um, some aspects of Asian American culture in my, in my piece. And so I think it's natural that Asian Americans can might feel defensive if they identify uh, with it. Um, so things like I, I didn't, I didn't kill Latasha Harlins. Um, wh why are you saying that? Just why are you putting uh, blame or guilt on an entire race because of one incident? Um, that's racist for you to be doing that. This, this, the arguments of well, what about Racism against Asians. Um, I would say those are the two main criticisms that I've been receiving. What effect has the last almost four years of political climate had on the relationship between Black Americans and Asian Americans? One thing is that with Trump in office and him stoking up a lot of uh, xenophobia um, that especially uh, recently with with coronavirus it, it's made a, the Asian American community feel much more attacked and um, you know a lot of people are when they say like Asian Americans experience ra our own racism and so why do we have to um, why do we have to care about racism against other groups that's made even worse when in the last few moments, we've seen a huge rise in um, hate crimes against, against Asian Americans. Um, I mean, in Texas, uh, Asian family, someone tried to stab a whole Asian family for being bringing corona, saying that they brought coronavirus to this country. Um, I myself have uh, gotten yells in the streets, or if I walk into my Uber driver, uh, the first thing we'll say is, oh, do you have coronavirus? Um, and actually, one of the articles that I, I wrote before this piece was talking about an incident in New Orleans where uh, some, someone on the street uh, came, went up to, to um, two Asian people and said, are you Chinese or Japanese? Because if you are, and, and this person showed had a gun and said, if you're Chinese or Japanese, I'm going to kill you. So I think the Asian American community has been feeling um, very sensitive and very vulnerable um, because of that. And um, the political climate is just furthering that because of things that Trump says, like the Chinese virus or the cum flu. <laughs> as far as uh, uh, that would be like the most acutely recent thing in recent history. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested to hear though, if you have any other thoughts about further back in the last four years. Well, I, I find it interesting that his, when he was elected into office, he was proclaiming that, you know, we're going to get things right with China. We're, you know, we're going to sign a trade deal, yada, yada, yada. And it's just very interesting. Before his campaign, he was anti-Chinese rhetoric. But then when he got into office, the first little part, we got a deal. They love me, et cetera. Now it's just interesting that election time has come back and he's gone back to his uh, battering, you know, 
interest, you know, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's TikTok. <laughs> so is it better for an American company to take? I'm I just putting it out there. I'm not saying I, this is my opinion, but I'm saying like Facebook collects data, Twitter collects data, TikTok collects data. So why is it when you, unless he has some proof that who knows if we'll ever know or not, that it's being shared with the the communist government. The other day, someone said to me, you know what? I would feel more trustworthy with the communist government getting the information, the, the American government. And this was an American gov person saying this. So us, us here in Canada, we're just, we're just looking and saying, and it, and this is one of the reasons I'm really glad you wrote the article. This is one of the things that is not talked about. And in both our, respective communities, the friction is there, uh -huh. right? Yeah, definitely. I will say that I have heard things that I don't think are correct said about Asians from blacks. Mm -hmm. Now just, let, let's just call it as, and same vice versa. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's not a pretty thing and it's been going on for years. And I guess in the, in the political climate that we're in now, it's just getting amplified. Right. Yeah, that's definitely the right word to use. You know, it's really getting amplified. So I am sad to hear that you've received as much. The challenge was a little bit over the top. So I wanted to make sure when you came here tonight, especially the first time you're doing something like this, we made sure that you have a brave and safe space. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. As we're starting to wind down the conversation here, uh, I guess a few questions I want to ask you. Do you see the relationship getting better? And if you do, what are some suggestions that you would make you would make to improve the relationship between Black Americans and Asian Americans? That um, the conversation is at least starting. And that's actually something that I kept telling myself. I didn't want to misrepresent that I didn't get any um, supportive feedback or people that were agreeing with me. It's just often the, the critical voices can drown out and be so much louder. But one of the things I kept telling myself was that, okay, even though it's a critical voice, at least somebody's reading what I said, what I wrote, and, and that I was heard, and that conversations are starting. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there actually are a lot of um, Asian American organizations and movements uh, in support of Black Lives Matter. Um, the Movement for Black Lives held a, a call that was attended by thousands of people. Um, that was a, um, a joint call with leaders from, from both communities about how Asian Americans can be better allies. Um, there's this great movement where um, Asian Americans, mostly from a younger generation, have volunteered to translate these open letters uh, directed to their parents into different Asian languages so that we get rid of that language barrier uh, as a reason to not have these conversations and talk about, um, start to have real meaningful conversations just like this one. So I, I do think that things are getting better and that, um, we're, we're moving in the right direction and, and that there's hope. Um, as far as what I would advise um, Asian Americans to move forward from here and keep on doing, I think is to start out like I did by just educating yourself on, um, on these issues and to introspect on how has um, anti-Black racism been a part of your um, cultural upbringing and what can you do to start to reject that? I would also like to add something and get your feedback on it. I think if Asian Americans could spend some time hearing stories of some of the experiences that Blacks have gone through. And I, th what's actually interesting, I think in those conversations, they would find some similarities and commonalities. And the more that you have in common with someone, the better there is a chance for allyship and understanding and moving forward as a as a people. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And um, that's one thing I've been asking Asian Americans to channel the racism and the hurt that we've been feeling during the coronavirus pandemic and to channel that um, to try to empathize with, with the black community. What do you think it's gonna take? I think what it's gonna take is that we keep having a hundred more conversations like this one where people from different perspectives and not yeah, I, be afraid to walk on eggshells and yeah, and not like, be afraid to be judged. 
and to, to make it a safe space like you've made for me tonight. Yeah, because Dr. Tachi has there, and I don't know if it's to ourselves or maybe someone she's communicating back and forth with on YouTube. What answer do you have to enlarge these conversations? And I think you and I have just answered that question by what we just just shared. So I think that I'm happy that you came on here. I really am. I'm very and and I'm and I hope that we provided a safe and brave space for you that you're happy to come back. Because we would like yes. to have you back. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so flattered that you invited me. Um, and I'm so grateful to your audience for um, coming and listening to what I have to say. And um, I would love to join you for, for future conversations and to dig deeper into this. And, and like you said, share share more stories. Um, you know, I know we only have we don't have much time left, but a lot of a lot of people actually left comments of um, their their experiences. Um, with with uh, experiencing racism from from Asian Americans, and one thing, one misconception I want to point out is it's not just white people that can be racist against black people. Thank you. It's a very. Can you say that again? <laughs> yeah, it's not just white people that are that can be racist against black people. Wonderful. What's next for you? Right. Well, you're continuing to do some great writing. Like I, there's some other there's some other posts that I want to have you come back on. So I wanted to make sure you're good on the first one because there's other posts I want you to come back. What 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 have you written recently and what are you looking to write in the future? Well, this was uh, the most uh, recent piece that I wrote. Um, before that, I had written a piece in reaction to that incident I told you about uh, where someone was threatening an Asian person um, because of uh, racism related to coronavirus. Uh, and I wrote about, about my reaction to that. And uh, one point I wanna make there is that, um, you know, I like in response to people who say that um, there's anti-Asian racism, it's like, yes, and yes, there is anti-Asian racism and there's anti-Black racism and I can be an advocate for both of them. Um, there's no, it's not a competition. Uh, so that was what the one thing that I recently worked on. And uh, what's next for me? Uh, well, I'm still um, working hard at uh, improving myself and um, learning more about this space. Um, I, I'm trying to do things like I participated in a 21-day um, um, exercise where every day we have to... Um, find find a piece like I, I listen to the 1619 podcast for example or I'm listening I'm listening to the um, audiobook how to how to be an anti-racist so what I'm trying to say is that I didn't just write that one piece and I'm, I'm stopping there uh, I'm still educating myself on this journey um, you know, one thing I did yet uh, just yesterday was I signed up um, to mentor underrepresented in medicine applicants to, to medical school um, so that we can try to uh, reshift some of those diversity imbalances. Wonderful. Uh, what do your parents have to say? I don't know. I don't know if they're they're watching or um, what did they have to say about me or about this issue? About everything you're doing. Like you're, you're a doctor, but you've got this social activist part in you. How yeah. are they taking all of this in? You know, I think that they've mainly... Mainly, there's just given up on me. <laughs> like, <"Will> we be <laughs> anytime soon. <laughs> perfect answer. Yeah. Perfect, perfect way to end off the conversation. My parents have just given up on me. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's appreciated, not taken for granted. If anyone would like to read any of your stuff or get in touch with you, how can they do that? Uh, sure, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is Crystal Zhang MD, um, and you can see the full spelling of my name there. Uh, and I and I'm pretty responsive to comment comments on Twitter. Um, and you can find what I wrote this this op ed and others on the Lens NOLA, which is a, a local New Orleans organization. I would just like to say thank you, Crystal, for everything you have done are doing and will be doing. We are expecting you to come back on the Dr. Vibe show. 
My name is Dr. Vibe. I'm the host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations. 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. Also, every month, I host and co-produce online live online conversations for fathers that are co-sponsored by Dove Men Care and Dad Central Canada's National Fatherhood Organization. If you want to know all about that, best place to go is my website, the drvibeshow.com. As always, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who watches live on the replay. It's appreciated and not taken for granted. I close out, as I always do, saying, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions, then aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. And thanks to BIA Media for making this an epic production. God bless. Peace be well. Keep the faith. And remember, don't waste this crisis. And because Dr. Tatch is on, be more er. God bless everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>